Hello, and welcome to today's Commonwealth Club World Affairs Program. I am Quentin Hardy, an independent writer, and I am the moderator for today. And it is my pleasure to introduce today's guest, an old friend of mine, Arthur Goldwag. Arthur has worked in book publishing for many years and has published several titles. And he is the author of, most recently of The Politics of Fear, The Peculiar Persistence of American Paranoia. Now, if you have any questions for Arthur, please submit them in the YouTube chat and we'll get to them later in the program. Art's book, The Politics of Fear, The Peculiar Persistence of American Paranoia, is a probing exploration of some of the bizarre and dangerous conspiracies that have arisen in the United States over the past decade, throughout our nation's history as well, and their relevance to today. Now let me begin with some examples from history to show you what we're talking about. As I read this, I learned that in 1960, Christian leaders like Billy Graham and Norman Vincent Peale gathered to warn against electing a Catholic president, fearful he would be under the thrall of the Vatican, permanently changing American culture. In 1938, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, a poisonous and paranoid anti-Semitic tract cooked up in 1903 Tsarist Russia, was read into the congressional record as if it was fact. Before that, in 1918, the governor of Florida announced that the monks in a Catholic abbey outside of Tampa were in league with the German Kaiser to arm local blacks to assist in an invasion of the state of Florida. And once Florida was conquered, the Vatican would relocate there. Before that, before Uncle Tom's Cabin was published in the 1850s, America's all-time bestseller was a fake book supposedly detailing the life of a sex slave in a Montreal convent. Before that, President John Quincy Adams also wrote a book that said that Ma Masons tortured and murdered disloyal members using their skulls as drinking vessels. In 1799, the then famous father of inventor Samuel Morse said he had a list of the members of the Illuminati who worked with Thomas Jefferson to spread infidelity, impiety, and immorality throughout America. You see, Joe McCarthy was not the first person to have a secret list. I learned there have been more predictions of end times in American history from the return of Jesus Christ to aliens descending on Earth than there have been presidential elections. Most of these have drawn hundreds or thousands of believers, and art shows they are a pattern, even though they are each treated as a one-off effect. So in case you thought Marjorie Taylor Greene's claim that a Jewish space lasers were calling, causing wildfires in California, Goldwag's book provides some um, perspective, if not comfort. It is a book designed to explain the peculiar persistence of America's paranoid style, when that is, seems to be again on the rise, he says presumably in the hopes to rouse everyone who isn't too vehement to come again to their country's defense. Now, as I said, I've known the author a long time and he is a friend. With that in mind, I want to underline that listeners should submit questions on their own and the tougher they are, the better. Art, it's good to see you. Good to see you, Quentin. In a nutshell, how did you come to see our contemporary politics as the latest embodiment of what you term a peculiarly American trait? Maybe you could start with your own experience looking at conspiracies. Yeah, well, I went into this world very much by accident. I um, I, the, I wrote a book called Isms and Ologies that was a popular reference book about art movements, political movements, um, science, it was, uh, you know, de defining terms, trying to put them in context. And when I was talking to my publisher afterwards about the next book, they thought it would be interesting if I went into um, non-canonical ideas. And we decided on cults, conspiracies, and secret societies. And I thought it would be kind of fun and wacky and it was very disturbing and when the book came out uh just as obama was elected i discovered that conspiracy theory is a very very political phenomena and that stuff that i was writing about that was obscure and semi-forgotten was suddenly completely contemporary again. 
And um, I was so struck by it that I wrote another book called The New Hate, in which I argued that a lot of what the then Tea Party was, was actually drawing on on tropes from, from much more conspiratorial right-wing ideas. And, um, and then Trump got elected. And suddenly all of this stuff is in the air. Um, QAnon is as crazy as any conspiracy theory that was ever in American history. Um, Trump wasn't going to leave office. Then he wasn't going to leave politics. And so I decided to write another book. And um, that was, again, I when I decided to write this book, it was in... It was exactly 2020. Um, I think I got the contract maybe the day after the riot. I was. I, I know that it was finalized on inauguration day, and I assumed that I would be writing this book because people were going to forget how crazy stuff had gotten, and things were going to get normal again. Huh. And of course they didn't, and I had to rethink the book really significantly as I was writing it. And since the book was published, things have gone off the rails again. But the insight um, with this book, I mean, for starts, it's interesting to me that you're the first person I've talked to who was led down the rabbit hole by conspiracy theories themselves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and what this one seems to have shown you above all others is that this is a long, deep strand in the American history, in the American character, society, however you want to put it, correct? Absolutely. And I guess I, I would say it's my discovery. Um, one of, it, it isn't really because a bunch of Catholic historians wrote about this. There's a famous quote from Arthur Schlesinger's father, I think where he says that um, anti-papism is the deepest prejudice in American life. And you you would read that sometimes in, in books by Catholic historians. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm just old enough to remember Kennedy. Um, what followed Kennedy was kind of the end of a very, very long lasting episode in American history, which is we were an intensely anti-Catholic, anti-Papist country. The, the, our pilgrim forefathers were, um, were anti-Catholic. They were terrified of the Catholics. And there is so much anti-Catholicism written into American law, written into American culture, and it's been mostly forgotten. Just gone. Um, I live in Brooklyn. It's full of new condos that used to be monasteries and convents and, and abandoned parochial schools because there used to be a separate culture. Separate culture. And anyway, it, it, it's remarkable to me that, that when you look at conspiracy theory, no, no matter what epoch it is, and no matter which group it is that's being attacked, it starts to make a kind of sense, the, the American varieties of it. It, it, it. it comes out of this history of anti-Catholicism. Well, tell so me that, about... That's, sorry. Go, go ahead, Quentin. Tell me about what makes it peculiarly American. Looking at Europe, there is a strong tradition of anti-Semitism. Uh, from six years living in Japan, I can assure you there are plenty of irrational conspiracies, both in that country's history and their present. Romans had conspiracy theories after the death of Nero. There are people in Turkey today who say that Armenians are running the Russian media. What's the distinctively American part about conspiracies generally or about these conspiracies? Well, I, I would say two things. One, every country has conspiracy theories, um, partly because every country has had conspiracies, including us. Conspiracies happen all the time. And I, I, because 
I took a skeptical stance in cults, conspiracies, and secret societies, a lot of people assumed that I'm just a, a debunker across the board, that, that, I, that I'm, I'm someone who believes that governments have never done anything wrong. It's, it's not true. Um, the difference between conspiracy theory and conspiracies is that conspiracies tend to get discovered and they have huge consequences. Um, conspiracy theories go on forever and they travel from one group to another and one political situation to another. They, they, they're they infinitely cut and pasteable. And so what's American about American conspiracy theory, I think, is not just the, um, the historical anti-Catholic bias, um, but we're, we're a country that comes out of a cauldron of, of um, religious upheaval and religious revolution. We're, we, we, we come out of the Protestant Reformation, um, which was a horrendously bloody and long-lasting conflict in Europe. And the people that came here basically came here to have, have religious freedom themselves and the freedom to persecute other groups. And um, then we have the American Constitution, the American system. That's the political system that we have is completely a product of the Enlightenment. And it's a secular system and it's a rational system. And the country has never been that convinced that that's what it wanted. Um, do, you know, do, do, the, do we want to be godly or do we want to be um, rational and secular? And it's an argument that's still continuing. Um, but you look at the the probably the original American conspiracy theory is, is the Illuminati scare of 1799, which was a real phenomenon. I mean, Europe was in the middle of a, of a very bloody revolution when that came out. The, the French Revolution was going full, full force. Kings were getting scared. There was um, the Illuminati was a real group. It was a secret group. It they used um, they used Masonic lodges as a cover. And the, the Masons are basically a, a pro secularism group. I, I mean, they, they tended to be Protestants in America, but, but international masonry, a lot of it is, is um, quite secular, rational. Um, most importantly, masons believe that they can perfect themselves. And neither Catholicism nor Protestantism believes that you can perfect yourself. You have to be redeemed. So there's a... a um, there's a um, her heretical element in it that 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 upset people. There's an elitist element in masonry because it was educated people, upper middle class people, professionals, doctors, lawyers, landowners, uh, small businessmen, and so there 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 was a um, anyway a, a lot of the. A lot of the language that 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 the John Birch Society adopted in the fifties to attack the communist conspiracy is pretty much the same language. Yes, I, the I noticed you wrote at one point, paranoia is the other side of the coin that is the that is the other side of the coin of the American dream of spiritual and material prosperity and grace. That there is a certain sense of spiritual fulfillment and economic material fulfillment promised by being an American, and that when that is frustrated or denied or foiled, that tends to attract um, the conspiratorially minded. That yeah, this and promise that, was not kept, something must be going against it. Yeah, and and you blame the elites, or you blame the, the secret groups that, that, are, that are looking to destroy the system. You don't blame yourself if you could, if you can possibly not. Well, the world is and... complex too. I that reminded me of a time in the mid '90s when I was with the Wall Street Journal, and 
I traveled to a UFO convention in Laughlin, Nevada. This was the time of the Hale-Bopp comet, and a UFO was supposedly traveling behind it and was going to gather up the righteous and worthy from America. And this guy, Whitley Strieber, who you mentioned, tells these people, they don't want to talk to presidents, they want to talk to real people like you. And the crowd cheers. And I look around, and for the most part, they are white, seemingly working class people from, well, they had the, the accoutrements of the Rust Belt. And then out in the souvenir aisle, as in addition with all of the uh, UFO books, there were books about the Clintons, and there were books about the Queen of England being in the middle of drug trades, and there were you know, stories about hidden aircraft. If only I had connected the dots, Arthur. But that They're is the pattern, isn't together. it? People who are somehow denied what they consider their birthright and then looking for some hidden manifestation of evil. They got something better. They got, they got a, a story. And, and they're the hero of the narrative. They're, um, they're not just, you know, people that didn't make it. They're people that, that, that had something taken away from them. And also, sometimes they're right. You know, when all the executives at AIG who played a major role in the 2008 collapse get their bonuses, that doesn't seem fair. And it's... when Trump says to them, you people got suckered, He's not wrong. Which is the, the power of populism is that there's always something, there's, there's anger that you can draw on. There's anger that you can, that you can it's there. And, you know, your, your description of, of your, um, your UFO convention, it's not that unlike a, a Trump rally. You know, there's, there's a, a guy up there telling you how important you are. There's people in the aisle selling you stuff. Um, it's kind of, you can build a business out of it. That's very American, is the, the, the conspiratorial entrepreneurialism. And the you note the extreme, almost kind of Baroque filigrees the American strand can get into. In 2021, a Japanese website specializing in aliens and global conspiracies dismissed QAnon as being too naive for our readership. <laughs> I mean, what's going on with that? Why do they get so out of control here? Um, why is QAnon still there? Yeah. Um, it, 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 it should have gone away. Um, movements like this have, have come and gone. Uh, apocalyptic movement. I mean, there's all the people that study this stuff. They they use phrases like apocalyptic syncretism and so on to, What's to that mean? describe. Uh, it's syncretism is like all of the the new age beliefs, the anti-vax beliefs, the the um, they all kind of come together in this this. Um, in this, in, in this antagonistic response to whatever the mainstream is supposed to be. If the mainstream wants me to get vaccinated, they must be trying to kill me. Um, pe people must be out to destroy me. I, I, um, if I'm gonna be the hero of the story, I have to, I have to, um, it, it sounds very abstract and then you, talk to people that are in that world and it's 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 almost effortless it it, it just starts to, to 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 affect all their thinking when I, when i went into this at the beginning i assumed that i was going to expose a, a big failure of critical thinking in america and what i discovered instead is like this Kind of spiritual void, economic void. There's a lot of unhappy people. There's a lot of anger, and there's a lot of denial. And I mean, the problem in America in the first half of the 19th century wasn't that the Masons had too much power. We had slavery. We had literally had chattel slavery in this country. 
And there were a lot of people upset about that too. Um, but you talk to the slavery people who absolutely had justice on their side. And there's tons of conspiracy that conspiracy theory that they have. Mm -hmm. The you know the the it just becomes a way of of, of making sense of the world. Right. And there's a, a kind of theme here of at each conspiracy theory, there is an underlying sense that your own group is fundamentally good and it's been unfairly derailed or denied by hidden forces, which makes it kind of a skeleton key to history which everybody's looking for, but is totally elusive. I, I would say that's true. And if you go, I mean, there's there's all kinds of, of new age and conspiracy theory things that you can, there are many, many rabbit holes. I was um, glad you identified conspiracies on the left, like anti-vax originated on the left. Hunter yeah. Biden's laptop can't possibly be true. It's a conspiracy. Trump's with Russian hookers. The FBI is persecuting Hillary. America controls politics all over the world. Um, Chomsky says Serbian death camps are refugee centers. Are these so the, different from right-wing conspiracies? Uh, qualitatively, they're not that different. They're very similar. And there's this thing called horseshoe theory where the extremes of both, both political ends meet. And you really can't tell the difference between, uh, you know, it, it, a, a lot of the people also traveled from one end of the spectrum to the other. Mm. Um, the, Lyndon LaRouche starts out as a communist and he ends up as a kind of fascist. But the, um, the, the reason it's so much more salient as a right-wing phenomenon than as a left-wing phenomenon is because the left wing isn't really represented in mainstream politics. And the, what people call the left used to be, you know, the center. Even somebody like, you know, AOC, members of the squad, they're just not that extreme. Yeah, they've, they've, um, they've moved the goalposts a little bit compared to 40 years ago. Um, the right, uh, a lot of crazy John Birch Society stuff. Um, I mean, my, my almost everything I write is, is influenced by Richard Hofstadter, who wrote The Paranoid Style in 1964. And he thought he was writing an allergy for, for all this crazy conspiracy stuff. Johnson got elected, it's done. And he had no idea that it was coming back. Just getting started. Um, but the group that you know the groups that he thought were absolutely beyond the pale kind of in the middle now and and we're, we're, we're even seeing unapologetic nazis you know um look at um god now i can't remember her name the the uh, owens the the um she used to be a republican propagandist she she was just questioning the holocaust at, at one of her one of her speeches this week. I believe it's Candace, right? Candace Owens, yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, Talk a little bit about the psychology of this. You mentioned something called a Reuben vase, which I was not familiar with. What is a Reuben vase and why is it important in this? Well, the, the Reuben vase is, it, it's two profiles facing each other and if and the the profiles are black and the space around them is white and if you look at the negative space you see if you look at the white space which is negative you see a vase and if you look at the black space which is the profiles you see the profiles but your brain can't see both at once mm -hmm. so it, your brain literally switches back and forth between them and it's a good example of how we organize visual data. Um, our, our brains use a lot of heuristics. Um, we can't take in that much visual data. We, we, we like our, our peripheral vision is black and white. We just, we fill in the colors. Um, we, we, um, 
we forget things when we we don't store memories as memories. We 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 take bits and pieces of things and store them in various places. And when we try to remember things, we have to recreate them. So the, 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 making up a conspiracy theory, I mean, it, it involves creativity and stuff, but it's also, we're, we're doing this kind of stuff all the time to deal with, with um, you know, to, it's just causes and effects, trying, yeah, trying you, to negotiate the world. You, you cite a lot of academics, and in academia, there are nothing but grand theories about how the world works. I mean, they tend not to get a lot of traction, and they tend to be followed by other academics in the field. But people will die on that hill of deconstructionism. Mm -hmm. um, you also, if you want to look at big, big political theories. I mean, communism is basically a conspiracy theory. And it's a theory of history. And it has a, um, it's it's a narrative too. Um, history ends. The, the, the capitalist system collapses, a more just system takes over. Um, Bible is full of stories like that. The, um, you know, the, 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 Prophets are, are are telling us, you know, the you're in a narrative, and the, the the people that are in the wrong get punished, and the people that are that are right triumph. And most conspiracy theories involve people people winning these battles somehow, coming from behind, seeing the truth. It it's all over pop culture too. I mean, the Matrix is is a um. It's a Gnostic story, but conspiracy theory is Gnosticism. Yes. Um, it, it, Harold Bloom used to say that, that Gnosticism was the American religion. And I don't know if he actually wrote about conspiracy theories, but they would, they would be a case in point for that. Many, many eminent tech people believe we are living in a computer simulation. That is Why a not? conspiracy theory. You know? Why not? It, Im I mean, it implies an operating system behind the scenes that is controlling us and taking us somewhere. Mm -hmm. And it seems that the more people enter into these, the more difficult it is, not simply because of the um, intellectual difficulty of thinking you're wrong, the kind of Ruben Vase thing you're talking, you're talking about, but also, um, as Rene DiResta said at the Commonwealth Club a few weeks ago, when you get to a certain point you've lost most of your conventional friends who have a panoply of views and opinions, and you're hanging out with people with a single view and opinion. And if you left them, where would you be? And it's harder and harder to leave them now because you can choose your, your bubble. Yeah. You, 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 can, you, you don't have to watch conservative television if you're on the left. You, you can only watch left-wing people. You can only read, you know, you can block everybody on Twitter that you don't like and, and try to get a, um, a, wor a world that, that, that makes sense to you. Mm. Um, and, you know, what's happening right now in, in the world, uh, you, people that go to Trump conventions, they're hearing Trump. They're, they're watching Newsmax. They're living in a different epistemological world than the rest of us. And they are feeling they are with each other. And they, they are feeling good when they're with each other. They, yeah. they, they feel uplifted by each other. The, the, um, I write about a convention that I went to in the book, uh, uh, not a convention, a rally. And um, I thought it seemed to me that people were very bored by Trump, but very, very happy to be with each other. Mm -hmm. it, it was like a religious revival. Mm. Um, now, I've mentioned, you know, there may be contemporary causes from the, for this, like the 2008 financial crash or technology kind of accelerating part of the world and leaving part of the world behind. But in your story, there's also a very long lens for paranoia. The first U.S. settlers come here while the 30 years war is going on in Europe, destroying, what, a third of the 
German-speaking population. Um, and then there's all this justification by faith, an idea that poverty is unknown in the new world. Do you see a long, as you look at this kind of situationally, day to day, do you see that long timeline? Do you see it in a more immediate way? Or I was interested to see if you kind of see an intermediate um, state of play, because maybe I'm a conspiracist, but it's striking that since 1945, Every American president has either served in World War II or, with the exception of Obama, been born in the 1940s. Mm -hmm. now, it's been 80 years. Mm -hmm. And yet the, the world, world War II seems to reverberate deep into American history, first creating the post-war you know, sense of American supremacy and wealth, and then later on the disillusionment or the alienation from that. Um, are all three things going on? Is this a deep history and an intermediate history and a contemporary history? Well, I would say yes, yes to all of those things. And one That's of hard the, to get out of. But one of the pieces that, that you don't mention is the the, the pre-war era. Um, the 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 the. There's a there's an economic catastrophe. There's all this internal displacement in the country, and there's a president who is both incredibly popular and incredibly hated, who wants to keep us involved with the world because he sees fascism rising in Europe. And there's a group of people that some of them are, are just openly pro-fascist. Some of them were war resistors during the Great War. And um, Lindbergh's father paid a huge political price for his resistance to World War I, which was arguably a much more sensible war to be against than, than the, the Second World War. Um, there's also there's an incredible amount of anti-Semitism in the 1930s that doesn't break through in America. It, it, well, Father Coughlin, this, this, the great radio preacher, had an enormous following. It and was millions and millions, millions of people. ran a newspaper specifically to promulgate anti-Semitic theories, correct? Of uh, uh, Henry Ford. Henry Ford, excuse me, Henry yeah. Ford. Um, and but the difference between America and Europe and is that we don't have a state religion here. It makes it much harder to ban a religion. And the only federal anti Jewish law that, that that I know of that got passed was in the Civil War when Grant banned Jewish people from the Tennessee area. And Lincoln vetoed, it, it was a military order. Well, how and, do you account for Henry Ford, who had enormous uh, clout and is remembered as kind of an American hero entrepreneur? When these things die down, do we just tend to forget they happened? It's remarkable that people don't, I mean, Jewish people, hated Henry Ford, were terrified of him because he was a, I mean, he, he, Hitler had a picture of Henry Ford in his office. He, um, uh, Ford is, is the, 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 um, the, the, uh, Dearborn, I don't remember the name of the paper, the Dearborn something. And then he, he wrote a, uh, he, he had them collected in volumes. It was a was the best Gazette. selling book called The, the Jewish Question. Um, it's, it's shocking how, how, um, how virulently anti Semitic it is. And it's written by he, he, his ghostwriters were mostly white Russians, the same people that wrote the protocols. Um, but it didn't, you know, when they, they, read it into the congressional record and so on, but it, it didn't make it into law. Um, and we tend to forget. We move on. And we move on. We just kind and, of say, well, that was weird. And when when people learned about the Holocaust, 
it made it much harder for these anti-Semitic groups to, to go public. Things, things are far enough along now that, that, that some of this is coming back. I have a couple um, of excellent questions from the audience I'd want to put in front of you. Uh, while doing research for your book, can you share anything that was the most shocking or surprising? That's a really good question. Um, so I'm trying to think of, of, of what shocks me at this point. And I think the thing that that it isn't it's never one thing it's 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 the, it's the it's recognizing the pattern um got to say John it, Quincy Adams use it, saying masons use each other's skulls for to drink blood from that's pretty it's easy it's easy that was to a good say punch. that cuz the masons have all of these crazy oaths and stuff they they did all this um <laughs> <laughs> they did all this cos cosplay. I'm sorry, it's not. They the dressed same. up like knights, and they they played with. Um, Masons were fascinated with with Catholicism. They, they in the Crusades and and um, I what I say in my book is is that they played with arcane religious ideas in the way that people play with scientific ideas. Mm. They, they were trying to get out of the box of orthodoxy that they were in and explore new things. So the Masons are really interested in Kabbalah, for example. It, you, you read lots of Kabbalah in, in, in Masonic writings. Um, There's you know what? Sorry. What surprised me in this book, I, I will say, is was the um, the, the Norman Vincent Peel anti Kennedy anti Catholicism connection. That just I wasn't prepared for that. Yeah. Move on to the next question. Yeah. Um, with the release of your book, have people reached out to share additional conspiracy theories with you? Um. <sighs> This book, not so much the um, the new hate and cults, conspiracies, and secret societies. I was just deluged with like hate hate mail. Uh, people hey, wanted to of, tell uh, me you're internet famous <laughs> in the conspiracy world, aren't you? Um, I'm not. I'm not well liked because. Um, well, I mean, if if I was well liked, that would be that would be scary. I'd, I'd be doing something wrong. I'm, what do they accuse you of? The ideas that you would think had died in the 19th century have very active proponents of them now, and they find you. You're in the pay of George Soros? Um, well, now everybody says George Soros. When I wrote Cults, Conspiracies, and Secret Societies, it was still the Rockefellers. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, I just found out today that Soros' son and Uma Abedin are getting married. So that should be... That'll be lighting up a few computer servers out there. You would think it would be. Yeah. Uh, another question. Do you think the rise of AI will fuel the spread of more conspiracy theories? It really could, because AI is always looking for stories that people want to hear. And At least can... AI as it exists now. You can create manipulated images and they you look can, so real. That will... You can do a lot and AI finds connections. It, um, I suppose AI could be good for, for debunking conspiracy theories too. But again, you don't, you don't want to debunk everything. Um, you, the, people are, People do bad things all the time. And, and it's important to remember that, that a lot of the reason that their conspiracy theories are as rife as they are is because people feel screwed. Mm. Right, 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 rightfully so. Yeah. Um, and yeah, the Tuskegee experiment, for example, massive it's conspiracy on them. African Americans, or as bad as it sounds, the the bailout in two thousand eight, you know, favoring bankers, these things concatenate. It's true. Um, so when you hear 
a populist leader say, you are my people. I love you alienated people. I love the poorly educated. Do you think they're behaving instinctively or do they see these long patterns and leverage them? Do political leaders understand this history and use it in a way that ordinary people don't? Well, politics is about power and power is about getting people to love you. And I don't know what a lot of these people believe, but hate is a great motivator. And if you, again, you, you, you want to look for repetitions, you look at the, um, the rural populace at the end of the 19th century. There is a long depression. There's farms failing everywhere. And the rural populace come up with all these great ideas to bring equity to, to poor rural people, but also just hideous conspiracy theories about the Rothschilds and the Jews. And, and so we, it, it's, happened, it's happened before. And, um, and you also have the phenomena of so many of the progressives um, they s did so many good things at the, at the beginning of the of the 20th century. And if they lived into the 1920s, most of them ended up pretty, they got into eugenics, they got into um, all kinds of racism. Some of the, some of the most racist people in American history, like the, um, Thomas Watson in Georgia, who wrote Watson's journal, I mean, it, very, very liberal social ideas, and, um, and they drop into totalitarian answers to insoluble problems. Exactly. Yeah, and that somewhat takes me to the current politics because you kind of make Trump out to be a narcissistic opportunist more than a true believer. Um, is that that doesn't sound like William Jennings Bryant to me? Is there something different with Trump? Brian was a serious person. Yeah, well, who, who came to, had a horrible ending. I mean, he had he he was a he had been a Secretary of State. He was almost president a few times. He he was a, a powerful, powerful orator, but he was a religious fundamentalist, and he was backwards, and he he w went out in the way that Biden may go out very sadly. And re remembered as as a as a weak minded old man because of the Scopes trial. Um, our political si situation now is um, I really struggle to wrap my mind around it. Um, but I've spent a lot of time thinking about Trump, and I've read a lot and listen to speeches and gone to see him and so on. And it's very hard for me to believe that he believes in much more than, than um, his own interests, his own power. I saw a video this week of, of Barron's introduction to the American public and Mac loves him. I love the idea of a new Trump. Um, I, I honestly, I mean, if if I had to, um, if I had to draw a conclusion, I would just say hate sells. Um, Trump is 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 really about leveraging hate. For, for, um, and that sounds and I, opportunist more than programmatic. And, yeah, I don't. Hmm? Yeah, I mean, I, it's like the, people are trying to get me upset about the Heritage 2025 project. I'm sure it's terrible, but I'm also sure that Trump isn't the least bit interested in it. He's disavowed it, it already. I mean, if, 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 there, if, if it doesn't get in the way of things, they can go ahead and do it, you know, if-, if um... Right. So this brings me to a kind of question that was nagging me throughout reading this, which is, for example, you say, Biden is not the first middle of a road politician to be called a communist, and we have seen Trump's like before. Or you say, in their desperate need to deny they've been had, 
all but a handful of Republicans have bound themselves to a Messiah that in their heart of hearts they know is false. Well, should I take comfort from the fact that this is a kind of recurring pattern in American history and something like normality has resumed previously? Or should I see a difficult pattern here that might be taking us to a new kind of crisis? I would go with the second one. Ouch. Be because um, we've had a long run and there's lots of reasons to think that America is a declining power. I mean, we're very, very rich and very, very powerful, but I'm not sure that the wind is really at our back anymore. Um, we've come through a lot as a country. I suspect we'll be around for a long time, but our, our system needs to be able to correct itself well, you actually, um, maybe you didn't see it this way, but I thought you provided certain schema that could be explored to get us out of here. For example, you talk about rural bias and how when people don't meet people who aren't like themselves, whether online or in the physical world, um, they tend to go more broadly into conspiracy theories and paranoia. And you say essentially that para paranoids pay a price for refusing to believe that they might be wrong and indicate a, the best cure for the paranoid is a kind of broad middle class, a, a path to greater wealth, which amounts to a kind of new kind of control over your reality, not feeling like you're a victim of unseen forces. So are there social and political steps that might be taken to bring us back to something like community? Well, I, I don't know what's gonna happen to the Biden administration, but one of the huge things that they've been trying to do is pour money into the Rust Belt and the rural areas in the hope that if there's some hope there, there will be less of this this um, destructive politics. And there's a lot of money making its way into these forgotten places, and these places are, have been forgotten. And there's been some positive movement with reshoring manufacturing and so on. And in general, in, in over the long arc of American history, things calm down when people get more prosperous. When, 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 you, when you look at a particularly crazy epoch, it turns out that a lot of banks were failing too. And, you know, it, money is important. Prosperity is important. And the rich-poor divide of the last 40 years, the widening rich-poor divide has played a role in this? Well, it's played a huge role, I think, in, in where we are now. And um, and we don't know that that's going to get better because um, a lot of it has to do with technological displacement. Mm -hmm. And I think we're probably facing a lot more technological displacement. Um, we'll see. Yeah. Um, I'm. Go ahead. No, I, I, I was just going to wilder. <laughs> <laughs> well, typically there are not populist recoveries, but periods where the rich-poor gap does narrow again. By the end of the Second World War, it had closed considerably. Are you saying it's just that much more difficult now? We'll have to see. Um, We'll have to see what, what 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 the world looks like. Are we going to be more globalist? Are we going to be less globalist? Are we is 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 the world going to shrink? I mean, one of the things this is, this is kind of outside my bailiwick, but but when when you read about the future, people assume pe people extrapolate from the present. They 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 assume that that populations are going to grow in ways that they may not grow. Um, 
prosperity tends to shrink populations rather than grow them. So I don't know. I I, I would like to imagine a um, a happy ending to all this. It, it's hard for me because I I the. the it's hard to spend as much time with conspiracy thinkers and haters and believe that humanity is fundamentally rational. I was going to get to that. <laughs> <laughs> but first, I wanted to say it struck me that how much of this is picking up the tools to weave a good story and how much power, particularly in power in describing the present state and power in describing the future, is up to a good communicator. In many ways, this election is less about policy than it is the ability to communicate a vision effectively. And mm -hmm. you know, the, the difficulty we have right now is um, you know, on either side, the other doesn't trust the communications of mm -hmm. that person. It's a for a, an era that's supposedly shot through with technology, this is as old as sitting around a fire listening to somebody talk, isn't it? Yeah. And that's 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 what human beings ultimately are. Um, they're storytellers. And so we're still telling stories. And we need and a better one to make people feel like they have a place in the future. A, a richer one. Mm. Um, unfortunately, most of the really good stories are about war and revolutions and the decline of, of big civilizations. Yes. And people do want to believe they've, you know, when it goes sideways, people want to see what was, you know, what went wrong and it can't be too complex. I understand that. Um, so let's turn to the act of writing these kind of books. Um, What's a nice guy like you doing with all these failed conspiracists in both time and contemporary America? That is, that's just a, a, a um, that's just a business story. Although I, you know. Well, do you have a hard time letting go of it when you spend that much time in it? What's funny is that I have a vivid memory. I don't think I wrote about it in any of my books, but I, I remember as like, a 13 year old buying a paperback book in the Port Authority building about the Bermuda Triangle and reading it on the bus home to New Jersey and just being terrified. And, um, and all of a sudden, I'm reading about this terrible event that had happened in my town where uh, a family died in, a, in an accident, in a boating accident. And they had moved the Bermuda Triangle all the way up to New Jersey for the purposes of, the, of telling about this accident. Mm. And that was they the Bermuda Isosceles Triangle. And they left out the part about the huge storm. That, <laughs> and I read it and I realized, oh my God, they're making this stuff up. And people read this. <laughs> And the um, I had been so scared a minute before, and I felt like I had gotten a handle on it. And I had I had done it by by being reasonable and rational. But at the same time, I understand how you could go the other way mm. if, if if that's the best way to get a handle on it. And yet. You have an interesting approach. I mean, maybe you're just trying to be fair, but again and again, you enter into various conspiratorial worlds and you say, I'm ready to be convinced. You know, get, you know, bring your best stuff, convince me. Do you think that's because you want to be fair or do we all sort of seek a skeleton key to reality? I think to the extent that we do sincerely, we're better off. I, I, I wish more people would. Um, as, as awful as some of the stuff is, I wish, I wish it was discussed more because you'd be able to, um, 
I don't, it's like when cultism and conspiracism go together in some ways, one, one of the ways they go together is that when somebody joins a cult, you can't reason them out of it, but you can kind of love them out of it. This is, this is what I'm told. If, if, if you rescue a family member from a cult, you don't violently deprogram them. You just show them that you're not as bad as the cult says you are, that you're not trying to destroy them, that you love them. And to the extent that people, the, 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 these stories that conspiracists tell are incredibly violent stories. They're about industrial level murder and rape and, and humiliation and destruction. And if we could get out of those stories. Yeah. Um, uh, and also, as, the, as we used to say in journalism, there is no better disinfectant than sunlight. Yes. If and you I, just and expose I, all of this and say this is how it is, it, discussing it more would introduce various counter arguments. Um, but in journalism, I also found, particularly when I was working on a wire service and people were exposed to all of the disasters that are news, you know, all of the earthquakes, all of the shootings. You were reading this stuff all night long as you, as a cub reporter, and you'd never had any idea that there was a car wreck in Belmopan, you know, or a shooting in Belize, you know, or some catastrophe, uh, name your country. And people actually became more paranoid. It was a joke we mm -hmm. used to have in the newsroom. They'd wash their hands more. They'd mm -hmm. call home more often and ask if everybody was okay. You know, and awareness can, awareness of all the world's difficulties can make you more paranoid. Well, it's kind of the world's problem now because we're all on the internet, but you specifically read about all these conspiracies. Do you sort of twitch into a little more conspiracy theory yourself or find yourself getting paranoid? I, I do sometimes and I try to catch myself. What do you do? I, um, I, when I hear myself saying, it's a little suspicious that blah, blah, blah. I, um, I just try to catch myself. It's it, because it's anyone can go insane. Anyone can finally lose it, and ultimately, you don't want to. You want you you. Um, I'm a writer. I want I want I want to I want to be able to balance things and hold things, and I want to make people think rather than just react. And. Um, and right, right now in America, it's not really happening. Yeah. I mean, everything everything so, is going in the wrong way. We've reached the point in the program where we have time for one final question. Um, go as long as and as deep as you want with this one. What are you looking for in the next few months leading up to the election? I would just, I, I, I'm, I'm so bored with Trump. And I'm so distressed by Biden. I just want the story to change. I just want the story to change. But do you think um, the conspiratorial stories will grow from here, or are this is the story itself becoming boring to people? I think the I think we're probably seeing the birth of a huge new conspiracy theory. I don't know what it is that involves Biden staying or not staying or being replaced by the wrong person or being replaced by the right person, or we'll see. Um, I know that Trump's story is old. Um, it has to be old because his story is, um, you know, they're out to get you, they destroy everything and we're powerless. You're powerless. He, he, the, the, the less powerful we are, the, the more reason there is to bring him back, supposedly. Mm. So he's going to tell an old story. Um, our side, my side, I, um, 
I just want them to be sensible. I just want them to say, look, these are difficult problems and we can work on them. Um, I'd like some more of that, um, that, that um, Masonic spirit that, that we, you know, we can perfect things. We can think our way through this. I don't really expect it. Um, I didn't, I could have never imagined two weeks ago that we would be in the position that we're in today. Um, we'll, see, we'll see what happens two weeks from now. Well, I suppose age, age and time are the ultimate conspiracy theories. And it's interesting that you're saying the story is getting tired as we have the last two presidential candidates born during the Second World War mm -hmm. come to their come to their conclusion, and somehow the story will change. Um, well, let's hope it changes in healthy ways, and the republic can continue. Uh, it's certainly possible. I would like that. It would make me very happy. Well, my thanks to Arthur Goldwag, author of The Politics of Fear, The Peculiar Persistence of American Paranoia. We encourage everyone to pick up a copy of Arthur's new book at your local bookstore. If you'd like to watch more programs or support the Commonwealth Club's efforts in making virtual and in-person programming, please visit commonwealthclub.org slash events. I'm Quentin Hardy. Thank you and take care. And thank you, Arthur. And thank you, Quentin. I enjoyed this. <laughs>